Thank you very much. And with your very last point, you come exactly to where I wanted to, uh, I wanted to come. Um, we will give you sufficient time to ask questions or make uh, uh, brief comments. But I want to address with uh, um, the, the two speakers two main issues. The one is about the role of politics, and the second one will be about the respective roles of the state and the private sector. But now on, on, on the role of, of, of politics, um, after what you heard and based on your own experience, uh, how do you think we can motivate in the future young people to engage in politics? Mm. Well, the first problem is from, in France is just motivate the youth to stay in France. <laughs> so far, that's the main problem. <laughs> Because uh, we need a changing France, we need a dynamic France, we need a France of creativity and initiative if we just want to keep the new generation in our own country. And uh, what we are experiencing now is a little bit like, um, I don't know if you heard about that historical moment uh, between Catholics and Protestants, uh, and uh, Louis XIV decided to, to persecute uh, the Protestants, and uh, we, we, we France lost at that moment uh, mainly his energy and his elite people and his entrepreneurship because all the Protestants flew out of the country. And it's a little bit what we are experiencing now. If you want to change that, if you want to motivate the people to stay, if you want to motivate the people to engage in politics, you have to show that by engaging, you're changing things. Since 30 years, you don't give people the feeling that through politics, you're changing the destiny of your country. You don't give the feeling that you have the courage to put new ideas on the table, to change the social system, to give stability on taxes, to, to put a system of creativity uh, through schools and universities. So you need that. If you want people to engage, you have to show that through that engagement, you can change the destiny of your country. Uh, my, my specialty is uh, tax law. Uh, let me be, be very honest, if I decide to become a lawyer in those days in France on uh, low spe uh, tax speciality, this is very lucrative, very lucrative, because France is very creative on uh, tax law. So I can earn a lot of money. So, as much as Switzerland? Um, yeah, <laughs> definitely yes. Um, so if I decided to stay in politics, it can only have one mean. One, yeah, one mean, can you say that? One meaning. one meaning, yeah, one meaning. It's change the society. So you want the youth to engage, you want new generation, show them that through that engagement they can change the destiny of the country. That's the only answer, there is no other. Thank you, thank you very much. You, I mean, already answered the question at the uh, end of your comments. Mm -hmm. So I'll go to, uh, to, to the, next, the next one. Uh, one. I, I wanted to still ask, since the main topic is uh, courage is to dare, dare to serve, could, you gave one or two examples, it was very interesting, but would you have, in terms of courage, examples of what were the decisions that were the more difficult for you, more difficult in terms of courage to take? Well, I, I'm going to give you a, a small story about my, um, my town. Uh, it's my, my born town, my, my birth town. Uh, my? My hometown. Thank you so much being a translator like that. <laughs> You're doing everything here. <laughs> no, I'm so sorry about that. But Okay, so um, I'm coming from a very small town in a hilly part of France, in the middle between somewhere and nowhere. And uh, it's south of Lyon. Uh, at uh, 1,000 meter um, high, uh, we have a lot of snow uh, during the winter. And uh, during the Second World War, the question was asked to the people. They were very peaceful. Everybody forgot them. They could go through the war being very peacefully. But then they decided to, 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 to make a meeting all together with all the family of the town. And uh, the pastor and the priest, both of them, announced to the people the Jews are getting persecuted by the Nazis. What are we going to do? If we do something, it's going to be very dangerous. Your family can be in danger, but we can save children. It's your decision. What do you want to decide? All the families, all the families, in every home, decided to take one Jew's children and hide him during the old war. Those people had no education. 
They had no real uh, open-minded uh, spirit. They were not a uh, worldwide vision, but they just uh, feel, felt inside of the heart what was good and what was wrong. And they did that. For me, it's always something I keep in mind. There are some times when you have to be able to take decisions which are wrong for your own interest, but you have to do it. Those decisions are the most difficult for a politician because I have ambition. I want to succeed. Uh, I want to be president of the French Republic, like all the French politicians. Uh, but <laughs> in the meantime, <clears throat> I hope that the applause are from French voters. Uh, <laughs> but in the meantime, no. Through what I experienced uh, with the same-sex marriage, with an, another decision with, which was a huge fight between me and, and the French president at the time where we decided to extend a social welfare benefits, which was very political correctness, but at my point of view, a huge mistake because it kills the difference between someone who works and someone who doesn't work. So the incentive for someone to go back to work is destruct, which is uh, what I mentioned and what I had in, in, in IDs when we talk about uh, work and the, the human dignity. This was for me a huge fight because I put my hand on the table uh, saying I will not surrender on that and I will say what I feel. And the French president uh, told me, well, that's fine, uh, take the door and, and go away. But sometimes you have to be able to do that. And if you're not able to do that, you cannot be a good politician. I heard very well what you said about uh, the lackness and the deficit of good politicians and... Uh, <laughs> The, the abundance of politics with a small p, well, sometimes, with the help of the civil society, we can give back a big p to politics. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Now, if you, if you agree, I want to go to the, the, the second question before giving you the floor. It's about I mean, the role of the state, what I said about the respective roles of the state and, and, uh, and civil society. And it'll be interesting for me to hear you also on that, uh, on that issue, what your view is. I mean, uh, considering the difficulties that the state uh, is fate, faced with, I mean, uh, due to the lack of, of, of resources, and, and more than that, maybe rethinking the role of the state. How do you say that? Would you want to start? I'm happy to try to kick it off. Um, well, there is a notable trust deficit, which everything right uh, underscores, whether it's media coverage or opinion polls, or people just simply not showing up to vote. And, and voting, if anything, in growing numbers for extremist parties, which are clearly not providing answers. They're not going to implement real solutions. They're simply going to say no to things. And, and so it is a point of crisis, actually. And so the response that some politicians have had, uh, I mean, what we have in, in Western liberal democracies now of an increasingly adversarial system, where, as you said, people are not even willing to listen to the other side, is one other symptom of the deficit that there is here. And young people really don't feel right that politics public service in the traditional sense is a way in which they're able to express their attitude, their views on things. I disagree slightly, though, when you say that the overriding value is profit. Because, of course, there is the profit motive, but I don't think that has changed so dramatically to what there was before. There is also an incredible willingness, actually, to share, to participate, to communicate in all sorts of other ways. The question is, can that energy and that interest be tapped in constructive ways? That's really the big question. And, and so what I try to present through our work and what we're trying to put into practice is a way to work at scale, because it's not enough if it's done in, in the odd village, in the odd community. It really has to operate at scale. And is to see whether it's possible to engage young people young professionals, members of communities, in really making constructive change happen. Politics will happen naturally as a consequence, better politics as a result of that. Thank you. Well, isn't that the answer? I mean, what is the role of state? Uh, it is not the former role. State is not going to do everything. We are clear about that. But it's not neither the idea that state shouldn't do nothing. We just are uh, going through a huge crisis, which was as well a crisis of the private sector. This would be crazy to take a lesson of that, saying 
We don't need any state anymore. This would be crazy as well. We need state, but we need state through a partnership with the private sector, meaning regulation, meaning offering a stimulating environment for private sectors and companies, meaning as well being able to forge that common good with the help of, uh, of the civil society. This is, at my point of view, the role of state partnership. Saying that, I wanted to give an illustration, two illustrations. This morning you mentioned long-term uh, environment for companies. You can't do that if you don't have rules who are uh, facilitating long-term investments. This is the example of partnership between companies and state. Second example, Europe. Europe those days is obsessed by um, competition policy. It should be obsessed by industrial policy. Those days Europe is obsessed by the figure of the consumers. It should be obsessed by the figure of the entrepreneurship and workers. It's not the same. This is the way I think. It's not the state uh, getting back or, 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 or staying away from all the, dif the difficulties. It's the state involvement being partnership for private sector and helping to, to find and to construct together this environment. We need state but not anywhere, not uh, in, on, on diverse ways, just on that ID partnership. Thank you, thank you very much. And with that, I think it's time to open the, the, the discussion. I, I mean, there is such a strong spot that I'm not reading. Okay, I had uh, 1940 on my program, but that's fine. Let's do it 10 minutes, that's fine. So we have microphones and uh, if, yeah, please, uh, here. Yeah, Marcello Palatin, just a very quick one. Uh, Laurent, when you said about the crisis, the private sector, I think it's important to distinguish the financial sector from the private sector, because in a way, the private sector was never really the actor of the crisis. It was the financial world. Uh, the wider point, uh, maybe if I may, Nicola, say one thing, I think that, you know, in the last 20 years, this discussion about the roles of the state, the market, it's become much more fluid. You know, the, the, many of the innovations come from people who actually live in all the sectors. They are, you know, civil society, but they have a business, or they had a business, or they become small philanthropists, or they become activists. So I think a lot of the changes have actually come from people who have uh, decided we don't want to have borders between business, pu public sector, and, and NGOs. Uh, and I think so. It's a much more fluid discussion, and I think that the. the the challenges I find, uh, which we haven't discussed, is what about the political parties? We have political parties now that are completely anachronistic. You know, why should we have the, the socialists, the communists, the democrats? They've been around 50 years. So what about that innovation that would actually allow many more people to actually get excited and engage in the common good? Thank you very much. If I, if I may say a word just before uh, giving the, passing the floor further, I want to give the example, for instance, of states outsourcing more and more uh, tasks that were um, uh, tasks of their armed forces, for instance, private military security companies. So a lot of the fighting for states uh, in certain countries now is done by private companies, which raises a number of very difficult issues. So there is definitely a need to think of where the limits are. There's definitely some tasks that are clearly exclusively made for the state, I think, at least. We can disagree on this, but I think but, but the effort needs to be put precisely on the identification of where these limits uh, are. Also in terms of legitimacy, democratic legitimacy, etc. But thank you very much for drawing the attention to the fact that now the frontiers are much more fluid. Would you like to comment on this? Well, very briefly, uh, I absolutely agree with you. It's the thing I admire the most in the United States is that capacity to make everybody work together, NGO, private sector, or politicians, think tanks. I think it's, it's, it's a great motor for innovation in the United States. Um, about the political vision, uh, private sector, I give you the point, you're perfectly correct. Um, about political vision, I don't agree. I don't believe in unanimity. I believe that there is a vision of society which is a vision more left-oriented and that there is a vision which is more right-oriented. Why? Because I think there is a vision and there are values. It's not the same values, and this is, uh, it, it's a good thing, because if it's the same values, 
it means that rule the society sh uh, would be only technical. It's only technical uh, cho uh, uh, decisions, and everybody can take it. It's just a technical matter. It's not only a technical matter. I don't have the same vision of family as the socialist, and it's fair. I don't have the same vision of social as the socialist, and it's fair. I don't have the same vision of Europe as many other people, and it's fair. The problem, particularly in France, is that when we come in government, people don't see the difference between left and right. And that's why they choose extremists, because they don't see that difference. You need that difference. It doesn't mean that we cannot work together. Of course, we should be able to work together on many topics as Germans are able to do. But please never forget, if you want democracy, you need to have different visions because the people need to have the choice. And it's fair. We don't have the same vision, all of us, of the society. This is democracy. We have to keep that. Thank you so much. Um, other questions? So there was a hand. Yes, please. The microphone there, please. Hi, I'm uh, Marcela Escobari, and I, I live in Boston. So um, in the US, you know, we make it very hard for politicians to do the right thing, right? We don't have, uh, we don't have finance reform. There's unlimited financing that makes it, uh, that puts politicians under a lot of pressure from private interests. We have primaries that put the extremists on the ballot. We have gerrymandering. Um, I come from Latin America. We have poverty that leads to the increase of populism. So we actually look at Europe as you know, the model of, of governance. You guys have the most experience with democracy. You, you, you should have it right, right? So I was a little disheartened to hear all these barriers. Um, well, you have you know, so many of the right uh, uh, you know, governance policies in, in, in place. So my question is, what do you think is like one barrier that this crowd could, uh, could help with change, a policy uh, in the system that would allow you and your colleagues to be bolder in the reforms that are needed in, in France. Mm. Interesting. Well, I, su I suggest one thing. Let decide that the French president of republic cannot be re-elected. <laughs> and let decide that for, let's say, 15 years. If you decide that, you will take out of the mind of each French politician that the obsession, maybe after two years, is just to be re-elected. We have work to do, and it's just impossible to do that work. I saw that very near. Because uh, wh when you're getting president, the first things which happen is that you get crazy. Because you believe that millions of people just love you. No, they don't love you, they just vote. It's not exactly the same thing. <laughs> but they, you believe they, they love you. So it takes two years to cure that and to realize that, in fact, people don't love you. <laughs> Sometimes it comes very fast. And then you just think, but maybe I want to be reelected to be sure that maybe they can now love me. And then you lose the, the, the last three years. If you want to cure that, just one term. Just for the moment to, to put the France uh, on, on the good track. And it doesn't take so much time. Five years, it's a lot. It's only in, in politics that we believe that to transform a society, you need 10 or 15 years. It's not true. You can transform your company in one, two years. You can transform society definitely in five years. Schroeder took two years. Uh, Thatcher, it took three years uh, to, to put really on good basis. Uh, and you, could, uh, you can take different examples. So I think just that decision is very simple, one term. I see two questions that we, so we take the two questions. We're very happy to do this and it'd be the last two questions and then we have to end the session. Okay, so, so just the outset, let me say that I'm, I'm very happy living in a democracy. Um, but that last bit that you just said is completely absent in totalitarian regimes where you're in power for as long as you're in power and you don't really care whether people love you or not. The flip side is that, is that you can actually make change if you're a good person. So the question I'm asking you, half tongue-in-cheek, but I'm half serious about it, is the democratic system inherently problematic because elected governments never stay in long enough to make effective change, and they're always campaigning? And is there some middle ground between the polarities of an authoritarian regime um, and, and a democratic freewheeling system we have now? We'll take the, the second and last question immediately also, please. 
Hi, Carolina Moller. I have a question about privatization. I'm Swedish by nationality, and we've seen a wave of privatization uh, in the country, and we see the same um, in many parts of Europe. We're also here talking about the common good, and therefore my question is about privatization of water, which is a hot topic these days, and I would like to know what you think is the role of government on this topic and, and um, how you can take a lead. Thank you. I will answer as well. <laughs> You know, I, if you look at the cases of honest autocratic leaders, there aren't that many of them actually. Right? And when you dig a bit deeper beyond growth rates, which can be reported in a certain way, you find so many problematic facets to it. Corruption, for example, in South Africa is rife today, but it was actually rife under apartheid as well. Corruption under Pinochet, some people said there wasn't any, actually it turned out there was quite a bit, and on and on. And, and so what on the surface, because there's no free media, because criticism is stifled, what on the surface seems like delivering growth rates and other social goods often isn't as simple as it seems. And that manifests itself in China in thousands of demonstrations every year right across the country for all sorts of reasons. And so it's not that they, their license and their legitimacy, of course, is derived from the poverty alleviation and the growth rates that they deliver, but it's not enough. And they're constantly under pressure for that. The biggest capital flight in the world and the biggest corruption in the world in some total is from China by far. And so it's going to catch up with them and it is very high on the political agenda in China. So let's not shy away from that. Western liberal democracy is in a malaise. There's no question about it in turn. And so there are things that need to be addressed, but authoritarianism isn't the answer. So even in countries that have uh, liberalized and opened up the democratic process, like Indonesia, which had you know, authoritarianism for many years, yes, you had voices saying, look at Singapore. But Indonesia has never been Singapore. It won't be Singapore. It's not a tiny island and city-state. It's a so much more complex society. And you know, if they weather these coming elections, it'll be a very good process for them. On, on the privatization issue, right? I mean, the, the data now that we have around the world is, is very mixed right? on the benefits of uh, privatization of utilities. In some cases, it's worked well. In so many cases, it hasn't. So it's a very mixed data set, actually, around the world on that. Very, very complex picture. And the question that we look at when we look at community integrity building, we're looking at projects delivered by NGOs, by international institutions, by the private sector, right, and by government. It really doesn't matter. And the approach can be applied to all of these. And people are concerned about things that aren't reaching them. So from a developing country perspective, it really doesn't, you know, if it works, it's great, but if it doesn't, it needs to be addressed. Okay, just maybe just very briefly, um, there are wonderful um, pages of Montesquieu about that problem, which are really brilliant uh, about the difference between democracy and totalitarianism. And um, at the end, to make it very simple, uh, democracy is the best when you have virtue, when you have uh, ethics. But the main problem for democracy is ethics. If you don't have ethics, then it's, it's the, the destruction of democracy. Montesquieu analyzed that it's on a very brilliant way. And uh, I would add just one thing. This period needs change. Change can be done on brief time. And that's why I don't believe that the obsession for Western democracy should be stability, but changes. We have a lackness of changes, not a lackness of stability. Well at least for France. Um, about Swede, uh, about um, the question uh, privatization, um, as a mayor, I just would like to say, if you have strong regulation, it's OK. But you need strong regulation. If you make privatization, you really need to keep strong regulation to be sure that it's still uh, the work in, in the direction of the common good. Just keep in mind, as example, in France, all the public utilities were at the beginning, at the end of the 19th century, built through private sector, but with regulation. So there is no, uh, it, it's not impossible to, to, to make the two things uh, in, in the meantime, uh, public services and private sector. 
I would just like to add one thing. Uh, it's about Swedish and uh, uh, Sweden and, and Norway. My father used to live in Sweden for a very long time, and uh, I worked a lot with Finland and, and, and Norway as well. And uh, as a minister, when I was doing official trip uh, to Norway or Finland or Sweden, it was always pretty funny because when I came to the meeting with the with the Swedish minister or Danish minister, or, um, uh, at the end, I had my car of the French embassy with the driver waiting for me. And the minister was just calling a cab uh, yeah. to, go ho uh, to, to go back home. That was just so funny. Me, as a foreigner, I, have the, I had the car with the driver, but the Swedish minister just called a cab, and that was exactly the same in Norway or in Finland. Uh, I like that very much. The Danish minister would grab his bike. Huh? The Danish minister would grab the bike. So I will have that <laughs> now, now, as a French MP, I use my bike as well. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> and um, you're most welcome on the Compostela Way. If you want to have a to have a ride, it's it's a very good place to to have some reflection about those subjects. Thank you very much. <laughs>